Greetings, comrades. There are usually two diametrically opposed opinions about Soviet-made cities and life in them. The first is, it is a great, depressing socialist hell for soulless robotic proletarians. The second is, they are beautiful utopian settlements. Once you visit them, you won't ever want to leave. And how magnificent is the statue of Lenin in the center of every single one of them? Let's not go to extremes today. But some of the ideas of Soviet architects and urban planners were really good. They were ahead of their time and made these Soviet cities very comfortable to live in. Let's look at what exactly was done right in these cities to provide a better life for an ordinary Soviet man. First of all, let's try to understand why, after coming to power, did the communists need to build cities from scratch or completely rebuild old ones. It is really not as common a practice in the world when in the middle of the vast taiga, or tundra, or deserts, or meadows, or forests, yes, not the best example, when in the middle of nowhere a huge city of tens and hundreds of thousands of inhabitants suddenly emerges in a few years. Perhaps the only city that comes to mind is the capital of Brazil, built from scratch in three and a half years. But it's just one city, and the Soviet Union somehow managed to build more than 170,000 cities in just 70 years. Why were the Soviets so reluctant to use the towns and villages they had inherited from the Russian Empire? What was their intention? This question was answered by Professor Lodozhensky in his 1936 article in Science and Life. From the capitalist era, we have inherited cities in which we see a striking difference in the amenities of the center and the outskirts. Whereas in the center we have good sidewalks, bright light, and beautiful houses, on the outskirts we have shabby shacks, sleazy street lamps, dust in summer, and the impassable mud in fall and spring. Of course, a completely different approach to urban planning is taken in our socialist homeland. We strive to eliminate the distinction between city and countryside. Buildings in socialist cities should be surrounded by greenery, with streets opening onto grand squares. On the other hand, the villages should have all kinds of urban amenities – asphalted streets, electric lighting, stone houses. It sounded reasonable, instead of trying to gradually remake old settlements, it is easier to build new, improved, comfortable places to live. Did it work at once? And this is where I was supposed to say, as always, it all started because of the industrialization announced by Stalin in 19... but no. Because the very idea of a socialist city, a garden city, a paradise city appeared in the minds of the leaders of the Soviet Union earlier. And this was the idea of a social utopia. Yes, in fact, the principles of the construction of early Soviet cities were largely taken, for example, from Thomas More's book of 1516. Cities with a strictly equal number of families similar in structure and management, village collectives around the cities providing food for them, mandatory allocation of people in the cities and villages to professions, no private property. Tell me, was I talking about the Soviet Union or an English book from 500 years ago? In general, after the Bolsheviks came to power, many saw an opportunity to turn all these fantasies into reality. Fantasies that were impossible in the capitalist society, but could be fulfilled in a socialist one. Therefore, by the end of the 1920s, the Soviet Union was dominated by the most radical ideas for the transformation and socialization of traditional life. House communes, collective kitchen factories, negation of the family as a basic economic unit, consumer cooperation… However, most of these ideas still remained just ideas. They were too radical, and the Soviet leadership was quite pragmatic. They needed to rebuild the country and raise industry, not to test unproven and not to economically sound garden city ideas. So, yes, Soviet cities took their actual and not utopian shape because of the industrialization and Stalin. In fact, here's the answer to the question of why new cities were often built rather than old settlements renewed. It was in the same concept of industrialization proposed by Stalin. According to it, the main goal was not to modernize the old industrial enterprises, but to create new ones, 
they were to be spaced evenly throughout the country, primarily in underdeveloped interior territories, closer to the locations of raw materials and, due to military concerns, farther from the borders with the potential enemy. They had to be located without focusing on areas with a labor force surplus, but on the contrary, the workforce had to be routinely moved closer to the new industries, and new settlements for this workforce had to be created. There was also a political significance in this. It is known that the Soviet government relied primarily on the proletarians, the working class. So if you build 10 more factories in a city that already has 20 factories, you won't get many new supporters in that city. But if you build a factory in a region with zero factories, you instantly turn half of the local peasants into proletarians, and therefore your supporters. The logic was simple, but largely correct. Well, for the new unique industrial giants, it was still necessary to design and build not ordinary, but special, socialist cities. And it was these industrial colossuses, not people, who came first. First, a site was chosen for, say, a metallurgical plant. Then, a necessary number of workers and their families, as well as service personnel, was calculated. The formulas were used to estimate the population of the future city, strictly no more than required by specific enterprises. Agricultural and any other non-industrial functional purposes of these cities were excluded. And only then was city planner given the task of designing this city for the right number of people in this particular terrain. A city for the needs of a factory, not a factory for the needs of a city. At the same time, a socialist city was supposed to be an alternative to the outdated capitalist cities. Accordingly, it was supposed to attract people to it, to show them all the advantages of the socialist way of life, to be better than the old ones. The task, as you understand, was not a particularly easy one. Located on the Ural River, Magnitogorsk was the first attempt to build a full-fledged socialist city, Sotsgorod. And the attempt was highly disappointing. Several design teams immediately tried to push their city project forwards, and most projects were very disconnected from reality. As a result, for five years the authorities could not decide on which bank of the river should they build the bulk of the housing, on the left or on the right. They made up their minds only in 1934, two years after the Magnitogorsk Iron and Steel Works had already been built and launched, and the city actually had about 80,000 people living in it. Due to constant delays in construction by January 1932, the actual amount of living space in Magnitogorsk dropped to 1.7 square meters per person. Magnitogorsk residents live in barracks, tents, self-built slums, and the typhoid epidemic was raging. In the winter of 1933, workers were literally freezing to death in their tents. Well, the planners continued to argue about what kind of insulation the workers' apartments should have, and how picturesque the scenery around the planned athletic field should be. Well, the first step apparently was too hard, and the idea of fully communal living and utopian socialist cities was abandoned by 1937. By the way, if you want to see a separate video entirely devoted to the socialist city of the 20s and 30s, let me know. After these first attempts, the Soviet government gradually began to move from the concept of the Sotsgorod, the city where everything should be common, to the concept of the city ensemble, a city where all the architectural features should be connected to each other, and all the necessities of life should be within easy reach. And finally, the needs of people, not the needs of factories, came first. Let's just say that in fact the idea of cities ensembles of the 30s in its purest form has also never been fully implemented. World War II, which destroyed hundreds of already built cities in the European part of the country, prevented it. But the best ideas of the first two concepts were still taken into account by Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Especially since the urbanization of the USSR did not end after Stalin's death, and the new population of cities needed housing even more and not 1.7 square meters in a tent per person. And without the utopian ideas of Sosgorods, that all city residents should do everything together – work, cooking, cultural development and even sleep 
everything had to be communal. It is important to understand that after the 50s, one thing was changed in the whole system of Soviet architecture and urban planning. But a very important thing. At the heart of this entire structure now stands a Soviet man. The government declares a strong connection between humanism and progress, the importance of meeting the needs of the population with the help of science and technology. Soviet modernist architecture from the 1950s onward is not about working with form and space, but rather about the search for the perfect balance, an attempt to find the best combination of architectural resources for an ideal life. A Soviet architect's task was to organize not only the space of a building, but also the open space between buildings. The main thing was the Soviet man. He needed a house. But each house was not perceived as a separate object, but was only a small element of the whole district, or rather a microrayon, micro-district. And the micro-district was an element of the city. And the city must produce something as an element of the huge Soviet industrial machine. Therefore, now it was always the rapid construction of residential buildings that came first when building a city. So, what did the ideal Soviet city look like? First, it was cheap. Yes, the main criterion for the construction of buildings, especially housing, was cheapness and efficiency of funds used. This cheapness, speed and mass construction of housing finally enabled the realization of the dream of the 20s and 30s, the construction of entire cities turnkey in a short time in uninhabited areas, in the Tselina, beyond the Arctic Circle and among the Taiga. And this time they managed to set up this system without major accidents like the one that happened to Magnitogorsk. The second main criterion for building a Soviet city was rational use of space. That was not what it means today. Nowadays, when a developer talks about rational use of space in construction, it means that they'll put as many 30-story apartment buildings as possible right next to each other on a minimum area in order to sell more apartments and get more money. Back then, rationality meant something else entirely. The projected society of the new cities was carefully modeled. Its needs and ways of meeting them were calculated. As early as the 1960s, mathematical models were used to calculate a matrix of labor interdistrict connections in order to formulate a unified theory of settlement in the new Soviet cities. Formulas were created to determine the various needs of the population, optimal routes to workplaces, schools, clinics, stores, etc. The Soviet cities of the 1960s were the most efficient and livable settlements the parameters of which were calculated by Soviet mathematical and statistical science. That's where their uniformity lies. Why build different cities when your best scientists have already calculated the perfect one? To change something is to deliberately degrade that ideal. Soviet residential space was riddled with invisible threads of district connection. The clear logic of their organization set the tone for Soviet urban planning. Here's where a Soviet person lives. At 7 am, he goes out, takes a bus, and in 15 minutes, along the shortest road, goes to another neighborhood, where he works in a typical factory or a typical research institute. After work, he takes the children from kindergarten, which, of course, is as close to residential buildings as possible, leaves them with their grandmother, and goes to a nearby neighborhood where there is a typical house of culture, cinema, or a library to spend some cultural leisure time there, and then returns home, again by the most convenient route. And there were millions of such Soviet people, from Kishinev to Vladivostok. And that was the whole point. The central idea of the housing and urban planning program implied universal equalization, ensuring a unified quality of life and a unified set of living amenities in the diverse territory of a giant country. And this way of life was supposed to be accepted as the only true and dignified way of life for a Soviet man. On the one hand, yes, it does sound like a huge depersonalizing anthill. On the other hand, this anthill really cared about the comfort of an ordinary ant.
So let us once again summarize the urban planning ideology which was formed in the Soviet Union since the 50s and its differences from earlier ideas. Now we in the Soviet Union build standardized houses with all the amenities, arranged clearly in accordance with the requirements of modern science, with the correct luminance, enough air for everyone, transport arteries that have the necessary carrying capacity and the required number of schools and kindergartens per unit area. But now we do not tie it so firmly to the needs of a single factory, we tie it to the needs of a unit of society. A family. Each family must be provided, even if sometimes at a bare minimum, with all the necessary things. And also for free. Sounds rather tempting, doesn't it? That's why the beauty and attractiveness of Soviet cities are usually not visible from the ground when walking around the neighborhoods. Their beauty can be appreciated on the scale model or when looking from above from an airplane. A western city is a living organism that has developed and evolved uncontrollably and spontaneously for a thousand years. A Soviet city is a robot built by people, perfectly calculated for its purposes. Did the Soviet Union eventually succeed in creating ideal living conditions for its citizens? Of course not. Did they try? Oh yes, they did. By the end of the 1980s, about 70% of the territory of large cities was occupied by typical Soviet residential building districts. More than 30 years have passed since then, which means that now it is possible to estimate how comfortable it is to live in a typical Soviet district of a typical Soviet city. Let's start with the cons. The first is, of course, the aesthetic dullness. Here I think few will argue with me, aesthetics has always been in the last place under Khrushchev. Brezhnev tried to fix it a little bit, but no matter how you paint a concrete box, it will remain a concrete box. The second is this narrow focus of Soviet neighborhoods and cities. They are comfortable places to live, but we must understand that they were still cogs of one enormous machine, which had collapsed in 1991. The main weaknesses of these were monotowns, towns built around a single large enterprise. You realize that after the collapse of the USSR, all these parts of one huge mechanism ceased to work smoothly and efficiently, all the logistic routes were disrupted, and for some cities it became a catastrophe. How to live in a city where 40% of the population worked, for example, in the coal mines, another 40% were their family members, and now these coal mines are closed forever. The third con is the neglect of the historical heritage for the sake of building another typical residential area. The Soviets did not even try to fit historic buildings into such neighborhoods. They were mercilessly demolished as a relic of the past. The same fate befell hundreds of villages and churches, and the farther away from Moscow, the more common it was. Now to the pros. In fact, there is only one advantage, but a huge one. The logistics of the Soviet neighborhoods. They always had green yards hidden from the roads, kindergartens and schools. There were always stores on the first floors of residential buildings, and there almost always was a park, a library and a movie theater within walking distance. The apartments themselves fully complied with illumination, durability and fire safety standards. Around the residential buildings there was a lot of greenery. The system of public transportation was carefully designed to meet the needs of the population. In fact, the Soviet Union was the embodiment of what modern urbanists dream about so much. You don't really need a car if you live in the city. Everything you need is within walking distance, and if you need to go somewhere outside your neighborhood, developed public transportation will always help. A harmonious combination of functionally differentiated territories, industrial zones, residential areas, public centers and recreation areas, that was the basic principle of the social urban spatial system. In addition, there was little social segregation in Soviet cities, that is, there was no strict division into prestigious and non-prestigious neighborhoods. Yes, of course there was the prestigious Akademichesky district in Moscow where housing was given mostly to scientists and the non-prestigious SALK district, where the working class from the car factory lived. But in fact, the standard of living in different districts of one Soviet city was about the same, which meant that there were no conditions for the formation of ghettos, 
a healthier social environment was formed. It's the main difference between Soviet cities and Western cities at that time. Western cities pushed residents to move from the suburbs to the business center of the city every time they needed to do something. To go to work, to the store, to the theater, to take their child to the doctor. Soviet urban planners wanted to make sure that everyone had his mikrorayon, a kind of city within a city with everything he needed. And all these cities within a city must contain the same set of services for every Soviet citizen. From an academic and a movie star to a simple miner. Yes, it still sounds like an unrealistic utopia. But they almost succeeded. And once again, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters. Stake 2 to 1, Steven, Yelizaveta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zeman Berze and Giovanni Zayas.